Hello and very good evening to all our dear students. I am Dr. Ruthi Raj, your original guru for prosthodontics. And today, from 3rd of April, evening 6 p.m. onwards, we begin our live sessions for studying different concepts of complete denture. Now, for those who are seeing me for the first time on this particular platform, hello everyone. My name is Dr. Ruchi. I am a prosthodontist studied from Ames, New Delhi, and I am your original guru for prostho at DBMCI MDS. Now, before we begin different chapters of uh, prostho, let us just discuss for a few minutes over here how would we like to go around studying this subject over the course of next few days, right? So, prostho, as you all are aware, that it is quite a lengthy subject, right? Plus, it is also a very important subject from clinical point of view for your case-based questions or image-based questions as well, right? For Both for NEET as well as for INICT. Now, as you all are aware, we have about 19 subjects that we study for whether it is NEET or INICT. And for all of these subjects, you cannot just completely memorize everything that is in the syllabus. It is not just one subject. There are 19 subjects that we have to study. So for these 19 subjects, if you start to memorize everything, then it will be a total disaster at the end. So instead of it, what I believe in is that you should focus more towards conceptual learning for good recollection of whatever you have learned as well as it helps you in your clinical work also in future. So because of this, I say that the learning that we have is developing core concepts of prosthodontics and that is how the teaching pattern would be over the next few days. For those of you who have not attended any session with me, I would request you that you please focus on understanding what is being taught in the class. The notes as well as other theoretical matter can definitely be provided to you in other ways. It would be better if you have a patient listening and understand what is being uh, taught over in the subsequent classes. And the schedule of the class is such that we have divided complete dentures, partial dentures, fixed partial dentures, implants, miscellaneous topics of occlusion, maxillofacial prosthesis with their due importance over the next few days. Now, CD and RPD, as we have observed in the exams, they have usually concept-based clinical questions. So, you can expect even tougher questions from here. These questions are usually case-based or they will explore your core understanding of the topic. Whereas from FPD, implants and other topics, we have noticed that they are direct, straightforward questions. Now, trends keep changing over a period of time. And we have noticed some change of trend in the current NEET paper also. I just saw a few minutes back that NEET 2024 result is out. And I wish those students who had appeared for it the very best for your results. Now, this time we noticed a lot of questions coming from implants. So, trends do change over a period of time. But if you have good basic concepts, then it would definitely help you out for your uh, MCQs in exam. Right? So... The goal of this session is that we develop good concepts around CD, RPD, FPD. So you do not miss out the basic questions. And even if something different is asked, you are able to comfortably answer that in exam. With that, we begin with the first topic and we begin with complete dentures today. So... In complete dentures, we begin with anatomical landmarks of maxilla. Now, you might be thinking that why anatomical landmarks and is it so important for the exam? Yes, definitely anatomical landmarks are very, very important, especially of mandible. 
I have time and again always repeated that at least one question is definitely asked from anatomical landmarks. The retromolar pad area of mandible was one of the most important, I think, topics from which questions were repeated and re-repeated. This time also in NEED 2024, we saw a question from this region around the mouth and maxilla question pertaining to modulus. So some of the other questions do come. Now, I call these questions as your cash marks. Reason being that this is something that you, it has been already identified that this is a very important topic. So then this is something that should be very well prepared and you should be very thorough also with it for your exam. So even if anything different comes, you do not miss it, right? So let us begin with maxilla over here. Maxilla, you all are aware, is actually a union of two bones at the mid-palatine suture. There is a gross anatomy around maxilla that consists of different processes and different sites, parts of which can be very well covered in anatomy. Let us begin with the supporting structures of maxilla. Now, the property of support if you are not aware, is something that we would discuss. What do support me? So, in very simple terms, I would like to explain you what does support mean. Whatever vertical force of occlusion or a force of mastication is exerted during any functional activity such as uh, chewing or during speaking or any other functional movement or even during any para function such as clenching, that vertical force is directed from the tooth to the underlying bone. So, the property that helps to resist or tolerate this is called as support. In other words, if you want to understand what support means, say I am sitting on a chair right now which has four legs. So, the weight of my body is transferred to the ground or the floor via those four legs. So, the four legs are providing support to me right now or rather support to the chair. So, the same function is carried out by different structures in the mouth. So, support is a property that is inherent of a prosthesis. A prosthesis should be able to derive support from what? From different structures of the mouth or different structures of maxilla and the structures which render or give it support, which help the prosthesis to give support are called as supporting areas of maxilla or they are also called as, because they bear load or stress, they are also called as stress bearing areas. I am sure you would have read all of this. So, the meaning of support or stress is what? Something that absorbs vertical forces of mastication and then transfers it to the underlying bone. So, anything that helps you negate that, that is called as the property of support. Property is a uh, inherent property of prosthesis. The part of the mouth that helps you derive support, that is called a supporting structure. Now, it is already very well established in your vouchers that the supporting structure of maxilla is the hard palate. Now, a lot of controversy is already there surrounding this in your MCQ textbooks, not in your textbooks uh, as such. Your standard textbooks have the correct answer, but in your MCQ textbooks, there is a lot of confusion. I will very well clear it out for you over here. 9th edition vouchers mentions something different, 10th edition evolves and changes it, 11th edition changes it, 12th edition changes it. What happens is in the early edition it used to be written that the alveolar ridge gives you support for maxilla. In the recent edition it has been changed to hard palate. So because the concept has also evolved like how the definition of centric relation has evolved over years, the same has changed for the property of support in maxilla. But a MCQ book or taking reference from older uh, versions or editions of vouchers would quote alveolar ridge as the answer but that does not hold true right now. So currently what holds true is the correct answer is hard palate. Right? So the ultimate support for your maxillary denture comes from hard palate.
basically they are the palatine process of maxilla they form the foundation of hard palate Now, why would you consider that heart palate is your primary stress bearing area? Why should it be the primary stress bearing area? First and foremost, it has good amount of surface area. And when there is an increase in surface area, it increases support. Second reason is that it is perpendicular to vertical forces. So, when something is perpendicular to the forces, it is able to absorb and disperse those forces better. So, because of this property, it is able to provide you better support. Microscopically also, if we see, microscopically, anterolaterally, Epithelium is keratinized and we are aware that keratinized epithelium will always give you better support and submucosa contains adipose tissue. This is another MCQ question. Anterolateral part of hard palate contains what in the submucosa? It contains your adipose tissue. So, this is another question. That is asked in exam. So, remember this anterolateral part contains adipose tissue. Whereas, if we see in the posterolateral part, it contains glandular tissue. That is why we even see secretions in the posterolateral part while making impressions. So, this is also a MCQ question that is asked in the exam. Very simple, straightforward MCQ question. However, if we notice in the midline where the mid palatal suture is there, the mucosa is extremely thin. Submucosa is almost absent. They are very thin and directly attached, directly in contact with the bone. Because of which, its area is non-resilient, which means it won't be able to absorb stress. So, since the area is not resilient, you are supposed to give relief to this particular area, right? So, mid palatal suture is always relieved in your impressions for your maxillary denture. Second area that we need to learn is your residual alveolar ridge. So, residual alveolar ridge, what is it? The part of the bone that remains after extraction. This is called as your residual alveolar ridge. Now, when natural teeth are removed, then the alveolar process will undergo the process of healing, it will have bone fill and over a period of time it has a good soft tissue covering and it gets converted into an alveolar ridge. The shrinkage or resorption that occurs, this is another thing that you can remember, is maximum in 
first six weeks. So this is a numerical that you, if you wish, you could remember. However, I have not seen it very frequently in exam. But still, again, another MCQ question which you could remember is that when is the resorption after tooth removal very fast? It is definitely fast in the first six weeks. Now, there are several alveolar rich shapes as well as forms. So, we will start studying them. Alveolar rich shape. We have a U shaped ridge. And as it suggests, the shape would be similar to U. That is why it is called as a U shaped ridge. Then we have a V shaped ridge. Then we have a flat palette with small ridge. And we can also have alveolar ridge with undercuts. Now, let us understand one by one all of them. A well-developed ridge or a U-shaped ridge. It would look somewhat like this could be a high well rounded ridge it has a good medium palatal vault and the center of the palate gives a almost flat horizontal area now because it gives a flat horizontal area it will allow the property of adhesion, hence retention will be excellent. In such cases, you will have very good retention because of this particular region over here. Again, you have a good horizontal area. It provides you excellent support as well. Well developed ridges are present, so it gives a good amount of lateral support, which means whenever there are destabilizing forces from the cheeks or from the tongue, because you have vertical walls over here, they would provide you excellent stability as well to the movement of the denture. Now, let us consider a high V shaped palette and associated. Now, a high V-shaped palate would look somewhat like this. And generally, it is associated with bulky ridges. When you have excessively bulky ridges, you might be able to see something like that. So, it is an definitely unfavorable formation. Why is it unfavorable? Because you don't have the forces of adhesion and cohesion at right angles to the surface. So, adhesion plus cohesion, they cannot be applied. So, retention over here becomes poor. Now, another is flat palette with small ridges or where there is an accelerated resorption, right? Again, this particular situation would look somewhat like this. A very flat palette, something like this, right? Let me draw that again for you just making it slightly prominent so that it is evident to you. This would be how the palette arrangements would be over here. So, although it has a good uh, 
horizontal part of the hard palate but because you don't have any sulcus over here so the problem here is a poor peripheral seal right so you have extremely poor peripheral seal and very poor lateral stability because there is almost no height of the ridges so whenever there is any displacing force from the side it would displace the denture so although the property of adhesion or cohesion could be applied but you do not have any other stability or any other areas that assist in retention or even assist in stability now the fourth one is ridge with undercut again a very discussed question in exam For those who are joining us for the first time in a session, live session, especially with me, I would want to tell you that the preparation around NEET as well as INICT and your university exam preparation differs slightly. In which way? There are some topics which would be important for university exams. There are some topics which are very important for your NEET exams or INICT. So the stress uh, on these topics would be more. And second of all, you need better concepts or conceptual learning when you're preparing for entrance exams also. Also, just to make you aware what kind of questions are asked, wherever I feel appropriate, I'll tell you this could be or... Okay. Now, the first and foremost important problem is difficulty in insertion of denture. Now what happens is that Just a second, we have some technical issue with my device. I'll just sort it out. I don't know why the connection has stopped. Just a second, I'm sorry for the issue that we are facing. And... Um, it should not happen, but I don't know why it has happened.
Okay, we are back live now. And I'm extremely sorry for the technical issues that we faced. Actually, we have been facing some technical issues with our local studio. So I'm taking our classes from my home, connecting various devices and trying to manage this because again, learning should not stop. So extremely sorry, but we sorted it out and let us begin with a very important part, which is ridges exhibiting undercut areas. So like I was discussing, a ridge that has an undercut area, undercut is this. So a ridge that exhibits undercut area, what could be the problem? The first and most important problem is difficulty in insertion of denture. Now what happens is that when you insert a denture, it would come hit at the widest part of the ridge over here and then it will not be able to traverse that convexity and go inside. Supposedly, you have pushed it very hard, the acrylic is slightly bent or expanded and it has tried or maybe it was able to go inside and get seated also. You would probably have excellent retention over here. But when you try to take it out, what would happen is that now we are causing abrasions over here and you would definitely have an ulcer and pain. So this cannot happen on an everyday basis. The patient will develop complete, uh, I would say, patient will completely become uncooperative and not even would be aversive to wearing the denture next time because of this. So what do you do in this situation when you have an undercut like this? So there are two scenarios. One, the first scenario that we have is when you have a soft tissue undercut. So this is a question that is asked very frequently in the exam is that when there is a soft tissue undercut, what do you do? So if there is a soft tissue undercut, the rule here is that you, if both of them are very deep, supposedly if your soft tissue undercut bilaterally is such that it can be managed and it should not be an issue for you, then you just block it uh, slightly in a way that it becomes manageable and then you utilize the remainder of your undercut so that you can gain some retention. But supposedly it happens that you have deep undercuts bilaterally. In this particular scenario, what can you do? So when you have deep undercuts bilaterally, then in a case of soft tissue undercut, you surgically manage on one side and Utilize the undercut on the other side. Right. So, this is the case of a soft tissue undercut. But when you have heavy bony tuberosities and you have bilateral maxillary tuberosities, and undercut is next to it. In that situation, what do you do? In that situation, you have to surgically remove both undercuts. So remember this, you have to surgically remove both of the undercuts and this is a very frequently asked MCQ question regarding heart tissue tuberosity or bony tuberosities. So, ridges exhibiting undercut areas, you will have bony tuberosities and that is the answer to it. Coming to the next anatomical landmark, let us now discuss palatine rugae. Right? So, let us now discuss our palatine rugae. Palatine rugae are what? If this is maxilla, and you have your incisive papilla anteriorly, you would have noticed raised folds of mucous membrane bilaterally. These raised folds are called as rugae area. So raised folds of mucous membrane, ah, sorry, dense connective tissue, sorry, not mucous membrane, dense connective tissue bilaterally radiating from the median suture in the anterior third of the palate. They are only located in the anterior one third of the palate. They are called as your palatine rugae. What is the function of rugae? 
first function is most important phonetics there are a lot of sound your lingopalatal sounds they will make contact positive contact at the anterior part of rugae and which is why the correct sound is produced so most important is phonetics second is prevents forward slipping of denture So, second is preventing forward slipping of denture. Some literature mentions it as a secondary stress bearing area also. I do not consider it could be possible, but just remember, could be a secondary stress bearing area. Now, most important point which we need to remember is it should not be distorted while making an impression. If you distort it, then what will happen is the denture will rebound because you will have said this is the shape of the rugae. You have registered it in this way. So, because it does not fit on the intaglio surface of the denture very well, what will happen is that it will lead to rebound of the denture and in turn even difficulty for our patient, right? So, that was your next anatomical landmark. Now, since we were discussing incisive papilla, I thought let us show you incisive papilla and where it comes. So, this is the anterior part. This is where incisive papilla comes and from our incisive papilla, let us now discuss incisive foramen. Right? So, the next in line is incisive foramen. Incisive foramen, foramen is, means what a hole that is present, a bony opening which is present is called as a foramen. So, incisive foramen covers the, it is covered by incisive papilla. And here nasopalatal nerves and vessels, they go to and fro between the nose and the palate through it. So, if you apply over pressure over this region, then you could uh, it could result into pain as well as paresthesia. So, definitely it is a relieving area and you should always give relief to it, right? Apart from that, we have another area which is a relieving area, which is our torus palatinus. So, torus palatinus, it is a hard, bony, just a second. Bony enlargement, also called as an exostosis. So, it is a hard, bony enlargement, also called as an exostosis. It is usually seen in the midline in the roof of the palate right so it is covered by a thin layer of mucous membrane and it is generally traumatized very easily Since it is easily traumatized, that is why this is a relief area, right? So, this is a relief area. Now, coming to your different structures, other structures such as oral mucous membrane. But before that, if you have any doubts, I will just open up our telegram group. You all can put up your doubts in the telegram group. Students that are watching us through YouTube live. I'll just check up our YouTube live and see 
if you have any queries and we can definitely solve or take up your questions. So we have a live chat here. I can see a lot of students are joined here to watch us. And uh, you have any doubts, queries, questions, please feel free to definitely ask the questions and I can solve them up for you. So I can, I'm already uh, watching here on the YouTube part and I'm live here. Other students also through our group. Right. So I'm putting a message here on our group. So any doubts, queries, questions, just put your messages over there and I'm there. Also, for other members who are watching us through YouTube, I would urge you that you would put your messages in the live chat in the chat box and I will check them frequently and we can sort them out, right? So, that is about your different uh, structures. Now, coming to your soft tissue structures and the first or rather I would want to group them all into limiting structures. So till now we discussed our stress bearing areas such as your uh, heart palate and then we discussed your relieving areas such as incisive uh, papilla, your torus palatinus, all of these different structures. Now let us start discussing your soft tissue structures, your limiting structures. The first and foremost is our labial frenum. Frenum means a fold of mucous membrane. So, anywhere you see a fold of mucous membrane is called as a frenum. A labial frenum means the fold of mucous membrane that is seen anteriorly in the midline. So, it starts from the inner part of lip. And it attaches on labial side of the ridge. Right. So labial frenum, it starts on the inner part of the upper lip. It comes inside the labial side of the ridge. What we need to remember is that Labial frenum has no muscle attachment. Maxillary labial frenum has no muscle attachment. Remember and always speak it like that. That maxillary labial frenum has no muscular attachment because mandibular labial frenum does have a muscle attachment. So it is usually single or it may consist of two fibrous bands. Now, main what when we study it again is during bottom molding. Now, during bottom molding, when we do this movement or rather I would say upper lip will usually have a vertical movement and since there is no muscular attachment, the notch that we prepare for this in the denture is a vertical eye-shaped notch. So, in a denture, you can give a eye-shaped notch like this. 
because there is no muscular attachment. So there is no right and left movement happening. There will be just vertical movement of the upper lip. So you can just give a relief of a eye shape notch for your uh, labial frenum. But the same does not hold true for buccal frenum. Now what are the muscular attachments here? We will study all of them also. So buccal frenum again a fold of mucous membrane extends from buccal mucous membrane to the slope or I would even say the crest of residual ridge, right? So, what it does is, it divides your labial and buccal vestibule. What your labial frenum would do is, it divides your right and left, your right and left labial vestibule. Now, in the impression, you should record it in a V shape format. So, the relief that we give for buccal frenum is a V shaped relief, or rather, not a proper V, we give a crescentric. Crescentric means what? Crescentric means this half moon shape. So, we give a crescentric relief. The role for crescentric relief is because of your different muscles that are attached. So, muscle attachments are very important. Remember them always. They are very frequently asked. Even this time also exam had a question pertaining to it. So, first and foremost, levator anguli uris or I should say caninus it is attached beneath the frenum. So, if you have a frenum like this, if you have a frenum like this, then it would be here underneath it, right? So, it is attached beneath the frenum and it will affect the vertical movement of your frenum. Second is vaccinator. Vaccinator pulls the frenum backwards. And you have orbicular resorus that pulls the frenum forwards, right? So, three muscular attachment, you will have levator anguli oris that is going beneath the frenum. It will up and down movement or vertical movement of your uh, frenum would be affected by it. Buccinator, it is behind it. So, it will pull it backwards. Abiclaris oris located over here, it will pull the frenum forwards. These are your three movements that happen. So, because it moves in vertical as well as horizontal plane, you would need a wide crescentric relief for your buccal frenum. Now, let us understand vestibules. We have seen frenums. We will see now labial vestibule. Labial vestibule is the circular area that is between your labial and buccal frenum. Now, with a vestibule, there is always a horizontal as well as a vertical component and the depth and the width of it is always determined by the muscle movement that is surrounding it. So, orbicularis oris forms the outer surface of your labial vestibule and fibers of it, they run horizontally. Now, I will give you a tip over here when you are studying. 
when you want to remember something like this draw it figuratively so you remember it so when you have drawn horizontal fibers you would probably be able to pictorially or in other way remember your own notes in the exam in that particular manner coming to the next which is your buccal vestibule now buccal vestibule extends from where from the buccal frenum to the hamular notch hamular notch is the area that is behind maxillary tuberosity so if this is your maxilla and these are your tuberosities this area is called as your hamular notch so if you have a buccal frenum here then this particular region is your buccal vestibule right it is externally bound by cheek internally it is bound by your residual ridge now what happens is that the distubuccal portion of buccal vestibule. Again, as I said, there is a width component of vestibule and a height component of vestibule. The width of this is affected by closing and opening of mandible. Now thickness here, what happens is when you close the mandible or when you open the mandible, the coronoid process of the mandible it will reduce the width of buccal sulcus. So when you open the mouth wide, the coronoid will come anteriorly and it will reduce the width of the buccal sulcus. So the correct way to examine the actual width of the distobuccal sulcus is to ask the patient to slightly close the mouth and then with the help of your finger go and examine the width of this part. So what happens is whenever you are bottom holding the distobuccal part you have to ask your patient to open your mouth wide and then close against resistance that is a movement and the MCQ that arises out of this topic are plenty actually when the patient is smiling wide if the denture falls it is because of inadequate buccal frenum relief so buccal frenum is interfering but if the patient is opening wide opening the mouth wide and it's falling it is definitely the distobuccal area that is interfering so this is a very important mcq question that you must remember from this topic we may think that anatomical landmarks are not very important and this is something that is fine it's okay but the the core of your entire denture or the foundation of it starts from your anatomical landmarks this is something that you should always remember now what else can we cover from here i have some images that we can discuss yes now this is another thing that you need to understand these are the different landmarks now this is your maxillary tuberosity and the area behind it is called as mammular notch. Now, let us discuss our mammular notch and then we can discuss our soft palate also, right? So, what is pterygomaxillary or mammular notch?
so it is a displaceable resilient area about 2 millimeters wide between the fibrosity and hamulus of pterygoid plate. Now, let me just show you what is hamulus. This is the pterygoid hamulus of the pterygoid plate and this is our maxillary tuberosity. So, this area that you see in between, the soft tissue part over it is having your pterygoid or uh, pterygomaxillary hamulus. This is a notch that marks the posterior border of the denture. You can locate it with a tea burnisher or even a mouth mirror, right? So, that is the different part of your, uh, different uh, features of your hamula notch. Now, before we move ahead, let us discuss uh, something about telgomandibular raphe. Tergomandibular raphe is also very important. See, for preparation, when we do for NEET exams and everything, we have a time crunch of a subject. Plus, we cannot actually overload you with a lot of information. So, you may think that when we were studying in our theory classes, hard palate was discussed for 20 minutes or this topic was discussed at large consider that that particular teacher even i was a teacher like that at once is teaching the entire subject over the course of one year or even more than that right whereas here we are trying to finish our syllabus not finish prepare you for that subject correctly in the next 10 or 15 days and in the course of next 30 hours. So, in these 30 hours, we don't want to overload you with information that is unnecessary for exam. So, through thorough learning, we have identified what is necessary piece of information. We only give you that, right? So, that is why it may be possible that you may feel that this is not going in a manner that how it was going systematically in a textbook. Rather, this is a more point-based discussion that we do. So, coming to Tergomandibular Raffae, it originates from the hamulus that I showed you just a uh, uh, few minutes back. It originates from pterygoid hamulus and attaches to your Mylophyoid ridge or the distal part of the mylophyoid ridge. Now, this partly actually the origin of buccinator muscle laterally and medially superior constrictor. The role of this is something that we'll discuss further when we discuss in mandible, but clinical significance is that it does not tolerate overextension. So, when you go beyond the hamular notch, over the hamulus, it will give a sharp pain to your patient. So, when you are overextended over the pterygoid hamulus, it will give a very sharp pain to your patient. Apart from that, uh, the next landmark that we discuss is Fovea palatini. I am sure you would be aware that they are coalescence of ducts or openings of minor and ivory glands. And 
they are formed by joining together of several mucus glands duct they are sometimes very prominent in many individuals and some you may not even find them so in the midline next to them posteriorly you would be able to see your fovea palatini like this now apart from helping identify the posterior border of the denture the another role that fovea palatini would have or other what it serves is that it will have usually posterior vibrating line would be roughly 2 millimeters anterior to it also because it releases a glandular secretion if there is a thick mucus secretion over it and if the denture border is over it and relief is not placed it will lead to a rebound effect of the denture over that region so coming to uh, the vibrating line since i mentioned vibrating line over here let me discuss that as well what is vibrating line now first and foremost vibrating lines are imaginary this is something that you must remember this was created just to make you easily understand so when you have a denture the anterior vibrating line which is cupid bow shape and the posterior vibrating line like this this was made for you for your understanding for your easy realization of the posterior palatal sea area so in anterior vibrating line just remember short bursts of ah when you do that at that time you would be able to see anterior vibrating line it is cupid bow shape and posterior vibrating line you will have to normal normally just say ah and you would be able to see your posterior vibrating line right between the two of them you will have your posterior palatal seal area right that is responsible for your retention now coming to your soft palate classification this classification in particular which was given by M. M. House classification. It is the shape of the soft palate is described. So, class 1 has more than 5 millimeters of movable tissue. The angle between the junction of hard and soft palate would be roughly in the range of 10 degrees. Now, when you have 1 to 5 millimeters of movable tissue available, you are giving an area for damming. When you want to apply pressure over a particular area for retention, that is the area that we are considering here. So, if 5 millimeter wide area is available, that is a very good area for retention. That is usually seen in cases of class 1 palate where the junction of hard and soft palate is almost at the angle of 10 degree only. When it is roughly at the angle of 45 degree, you will have 1 to 5 millimeters. And when it is very abrupt like this, such as in a 70 degree angle, you will have less than 1 millimeter. Now, you may ask a question, how do I identify that? It comes with practice. And to be very honest, a 10 degree class 1 palette and a 3, I would say 70 degree class 3 palette is easy to identify because of the abruptness. But you would always get confused between a class 1 and a class 2 because quite frankly there is no tool with which you would be able to measure your soft palette like this. So the conclusion of all of this is what? The conclusion of all of this is that the scientific knowledge that we have of the denture supporting area, it helps us formulate a denture better. Now, you may think that when I'm studying for my NEET exam, why does landmark or what does landmark help me? I'll tell you what. These are the different structures that if you know their properties well, 
half of the job is done because now you would know what kind of impression is necessary why that particular impression is done why relief is given why that thickness of spacer was used there are a lot of principles that are surrounding the anatomy of structures so some part of your understanding gets developed over here which is why we study the first part of this class as the anatomy of maxilla and its supporting structures so with this we can take a small break it is about one hour into our session we can definitely take a small break over here and i'll just open up our group and we can see if there are any doubts queries and questions we can definitely take them up after this small i would say water break we can definitely start with the anatomical landmarks of mandible So for all our students who have joined the free demo class via YouTube, I would urge if there is any doubt or query, please post them in the YouTube chat box live chat and I am here live and I can solve it for you. For If you like the session, you can definitely join us for further sessions in future and they could be helpful to all of you. हेलो रिश्व सेशन ये यहाँ से ब्रेक लेना है 